ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everyone. You know, um, I don't know how many of you, when you saw me today, were like, are you supposed to be here? Um, if you don't know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go on a sabbatical. And uh, last week I mentioned it was the last week I was going to be preaching for a little while. And so, yeah, a lot of you were like, aren't you supposed to be gone? And I, can't, I couldn't tell if you were like, concerned for my well-being or are you just ready for me to, you know, ready for a break from Vic? I don't know what it was, but... Um, no, I, I'll be leaving uh, after this Sunday for a, a little while, and so I'll continue to just ask you to be praying for me and my family, just for a time of refreshing, just for the Lord to use that. Um, if you've been around Emmaus for any amount of time, you know that uh, we're a congregation that really believes that we are the church, and so, you know, we need one another, and we need you to step up and be a part of the body. Those of you who are new and coming to the partnership class, you'll hear more about that tonight, but... Um, it's really, it's never been about a person other than Jesus, right? It never should be, and it's not about a, a personality. It's about us coming together, being the church, which is the family of God, living on mission together. And we have a heart for the nations, and that's why every Sunday you hear a missions moment. And it always, uh, it's refreshing to me, it's encouraging to me, and it's challenging to me. And I hope it is for you as well, and to know, like, David and Joy serving for so long, on the field and then to hear what's going on in India and this morning you're going to hear in just in a minute from Brock Johnson who uh, he and his family have been in, were in Guatemala for a number of years um, now we're back here looking to see what's next for the ministry of the BVSA which many of you know about I don't have time to, to go into too much detail about that but I do want to say this before he comes up um, you know I'm just a guy using the gifts that God's given to me to try to advance his kingdom and fulfill my purpose here on the earth. And I think Brock would say the same thing. He's just a, a person who is a, a part of the, the body of Christ, a part of God's kingdom, trying to fulfill God's call on his life. And we're no different than any of you. And so I just want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to surrender to, to God, to hear what God has to say to you today about um, being that person, about hearing his word, abiding in him. And, you know, and so you just never know. We talked about this last, you know, few weeks. I've mentioned it if you watch the Morning Connection thing I do. You know, you never know the ripple effect of your life when you surrender to God and just disciple individuals, pour your life into other people. And so I just never forget meeting Brock at Five Guys Burgers at Town Center. It was when, you know, we had just started doing a Bible study. I think maybe we had 50 or so people gathered. We had just rented a little space. Brock and Carrie had just packed their family up into like 10 Rubbermaid, you know, containers. And they were getting ready that week to move to Guatemala, just following the call of God. You know, no mission agency, no sending church. Didn't even know Spanish. They just knew that God said go. And now here we are. I don't know, 13, 14 years later, and uh, they oversee the ministry of BVSA, which is, I think, in four countries, if you include the U.S., and, and expanding, and, and, and it includes, you know, our ministry here, all of you, and the missionaries that we're able to support. And so, um, Brock, if you'll come on up, I want to ask Brock, come up, I want to pray for him as he gets ready to, to share the word, and um, I know we're going to be encouraged this morning, and challenged, and I'm excited to hear what God has to say through my brother. So, love you. God, thank you for Brock. Thank you for my friend. Thank you for the call on his life. And God, all that you have done and are doing through him and his family, the ministry of BVSA, I thank you that he's part of this extended family. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you just fill him. God, that you'd use him this morning to, to speak to us. Help each one of us, God to be open to what you have to say to us. Holy Spirit, quicken our hearts and our minds. Let us hear from you. And God, we want to we wanna be people who surrender to you and produce the fruit that you have for us. So God, let this morning be a part of that process. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
as missionaries, we're passionate about taking the gospel to the world, especially to people who have never heard. It's what drives us, it's what we think about all the time, and you would think that when we come back, when I come back here to share with you, it would be able to be light and, um, you know, a family, home church of believers, and maybe some updates from the field, but I never feel that way. It's like God just doesn't let me I guess what I'm saying is when, I'm, when I have the opportunity to share with believers, I feel like there's the same amount of weight and consequence. Because so often in the scriptures, when Jesus would speak to people who were believers, as the story plays out, you find out that they really weren't. And so I come back to the States and I always kind of feel like it should just be this big encouragement, all, we're all believers, and send back out to the field, and I, I always feel like God says no. Same weight, the same consequence. Preach the truth, because it's just as important when you're sharing to a body of, of people who say they follow him. And so, Vic even asked me, like, share a little bit about our history, and, and I just, I told him, God's given me something else. Um, and if that's okay, I'm just going to jump right into it. We're going to be in John 15 and John 8. Um, so I'm going to start. Well, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about, about my story because the, the message I want to share is about abiding in Christ. And sometimes I think people hear that phrase and just maybe aren't 100% sure what it means. Um, and I want to share with you a little bit of my story about uh, how God has brought me to at least my understanding of what it means to abide, to abide in him. About 18 years ago, after God had rescued me just out of the pit of lostness and sin, um, my wife and I started our journey of abiding. Um, and I remember being on our knees at a conference just praying like God, first of all, repenting, but then just, Lord, help us to start over. Like, we come before you and, and ask that you would erase anything that we've ever heard that wasn't you, whether it be in our church experiences or our upbringing, whatever it is, just clear it out. We come empty, blank sheet of paper, rewrite the story. And, and he led us to abide here. And so since then, it's just been a journey, and it's still going on of what it means to abide. And that's what I want to talk about um, a little bit today. We're going to start in, in John 15, which Levi read from. I'm going to read from it again. We're going to go from verse 4 to 11. John 15, 4 through 11. <clears throat> it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now there's a lot in there. A lot more than we're going to be able to talk about today. But I do just want to kind of get to the point of what it means to abide in him. To abide in Christ is to be like the branch that is firmly connected to the vine or the trunk. And all of the water and nutrients and life that is in the vine is what's sustaining and giving life to the branch. It keeps it alive and it produces fruit. The branch is utterly dependent upon the vine. To not abide in the vine is to be a dead branch. Just like for us not to abide in Christ is to be, a, is to be spiritually dead. Now in verse 6, 
Jesus says, if anyone doesn't abide in me, if anyone doesn't abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. <clears throat> now, the image of being thrown into the fire here is a symbol for hell. Okay, so clearly this is a serious teaching. Jesus is not messing around when he talks about what it means to abide in him. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's gathered up and thrown into the fire. Now, there's a handful of examples in Scripture where you hear Jesus say, if anyone doesn't, blank. They're all very serious. Okay, in this case, he's saying, if anyone doesn't abide in me, you'll be thrown into the fire. Now, I want you to notice what he doesn't say there. He doesn't say, if anyone doesn't ask me into their heart, they're thrown away. He doesn't say, if anyone doesn't go to church, they'll be thrown away. He doesn't say, if anyone doesn't identify as a Christian, they'll be thrown away. So if anybody is clinging to any of those sort of false assurances, I want you to know that they are false. Okay, in the end, we won't be able to say, but I prayed, but I went to church, but I was a missionary. We won't be able to say that. That won't carry any weight. It reminds me of Matthew 7. It's exactly what Jesus says. Many will come to me and they'll say, but we, and there's a list of things there, but we did all these things. And he says back to them, some of the scariest words that you could ever imagine, depart from me, I never knew you. Now remember, these are people who said they followed him. And they argued, but we did all of this. Depart from me, I never knew you. You'll notice that none of those people said, but Jesus, we abided in you. Right? So what does abide mean? In the ESV version, I counted 47 times that it's used in the scriptures. Oftentimes it's spoken by Jesus in the book of John. John also uses it a lot in his other letters. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of Revelation, which John also wrote. A couple of times it means to obey, kind of like we use it today, abide by the rules. But almost always in the scriptures, it means to remain, to remain or to stay. It's a much weightier stay than the way we use stay. It's not like, hey, abide there for a second, I'll be right back. It's more like, Remain in, live in, dwell in, okay? So if you take that understanding and apply it back to John 15, it says, whoever abides in me and I in him means whoever dwells in me, whoever stays, remains, lives in me, I in him. All right, but here's the key, and this is what really I want to share. This is the main point of this entire message, is that I want you to, See, I want to help you see the connection between abide and something else. And we're going to go to the Word and look at it, but I want you to see the connection between abide and one other thing that's critically important, because if we don't draw this connection, we're in deep, deep trouble. Somebody could easily think that they are connected to the vine, when in reality they are not based on some of these false assurances that I just talked about. Somebody could easily say, I'm connected to the vine because I claim Christianity, so I'm connected. Or I'll never renounce my faith, which means, which means I'm always connected, I'm good. Or I ask Jesus into my heart, so therefore I'm good, I'm connected forever, and no one can take me out of his hand because it says so in John 10, no one can snatch me out of the Father's hand. Well, the only problem with all that is none of it's biblical. That's not what John 10 is talking about. So we have to be very careful not to think of abiding in Christ in some sort of ambiguous way. And my goal is to make it unambiguous today, what abiding in Christ means. Because that's exactly what Satan wants, by the way, to keep it ambiguous. For us to not understand or not really even think about what abiding in Christ means. I think that he would love it if we would keep that ambiguous in our minds and just not understand it, that's exactly what he's hoping for. And so that's my goal for today, to help make it a little bit more clear. So I want to go back to the word and try to show you, convince you, and hopefully it will convict you as to what abiding means. I've pulled a handful of verses from 
the word abide in the scriptures, okay? Some of them are in John 15, which we just read. Some are in John 8, and then there's a couple more. The ones, the verses that don't have the word abide in them, the context is abiding. So you can go back and read that and see where I'm going with this. But remember, I want you guys to look for what all of these have in common, okay? And we're going to draw this connection to what abiding means. Starting in John 15, verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken in you. Now be looking for it. I'm going to ask you after these 10 or so verses what you saw the common thread was. Verse 3, already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Verse 14, if you're my friends, you'll do what I command you. Go into chapter 8, or John 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Verse 37, I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to to kill me because my word finds no place in you. Verse 43, why do you not understand what I say? It's because you can't bear to hear my word. Verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. 1 John 2, 14, I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. 2 John 1, everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Do you guys see it? What was it? Yeah, the Word. I think we highlighted them in some slides, but if you go back through them, Verse 3, word. Verse 7, my words. Verse 10, my commandments. 15, 14, command you. 8, 31, my word. 8, 37, my word. 8, 43, my word. 8, 47, words of God. 1 John 2, 14, word of God. 2 John 1, teaching of Christ. Teaching. The Bible talks about itself a lot, okay? The value and importance of the Word of God is all over the Word of God. What makes that collection of passages we just went through unique, they're all in the context of abiding. Making it clear that to abide in Christ is to abide in His Word. To abide in Christ is to abide in his word. To know Christ is to know his word. It's no less the reason we have his word. To know Jesus. To hear from him. To know him. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Matthew 4.4 Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Not by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. John 6, 63, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I've spoken are spirit and life. Man, the importance of God's word. Now let's flip over to John 8. Some of those references were from John 8. I want to look at that just a little bit closer, starting in verse 31. John 8, 31 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. That is massive. First off, he's talking to the Jews who had believed in him. That's number one. Who here believes in him? Me too. So he's talking to us here. Okay, he's talking to the Jews who have believed in him, which is amazing and insane in light of where this is about to go. I'm just going to warn you. So this message is for us. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then picking up in verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 33, they answered him, we're offspring of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say 
you will become free. So the Jews here who had just believed in him, they didn't like what Jesus was saying. They said, we are free. We are sons of Abraham. We are Jews. We're not slaves. So what is this you're telling us about I've got to abide in your word in order to be free? I've got to abide in your word in order to be a true disciple. Jesus said back, verse 34, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus says back, you are slaves. You're slaves to your sin, right? And only I can free you from your sin. Then in verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. In verse 43, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. He says, why, you don't, why do you not understand what I say? It's because you can't bear to hear my word. Then he goes on in the next few verses to tell them they might be sons of Abraham by birth, but they're actually sons of the devil. That didn't go over very well with these guys. Verse 47, he says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. Okay, then the chapter ends with these people who had just believed in Jesus trying to kill Jesus. So Jesus says, if God were your father, you'd love me. And if you loved me, you'd abide in my word. Okay, this is big time, big time teaching from Jesus. And I'm trying to give you the importance of the word and abiding. They go hand in hand because we have a crisis in the church. I believe that. It's not that we don't say we believe. Everybody says that. The crisis is that we don't know what we believe because we don't put time in the word. So all kinds of people are saying all kinds of things about Jesus and what they believe without actually spending time in the word. And that's what Jesus was saying here. So you call yourself one thing and you say one thing, but I'm trying to tell you something different. And now we have all of this truth that we need to study and know in order to understand what it is that we believe. He says, if you loved me, you would abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciple. And if you're a true disciple, you know the truth. If you're a true disciple, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we cannot know the truth without knowing the word. Now in verse 31 there, when he says, if you abide in my word, singular, my word, He's talking about the sum of his words. Okay, God's revealed word in its totality. <clears throat> all of Jesus' teaching, all of God's revelation to us through Jesus, through his word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word itself, right here, makes very clear the sanctity and inerrancy and perfection and importance of the now written word that we have today. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing th to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, living and active, the word of God. Isaiah 40, verse 8 the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand. So the word that we are to abide in is the sum. It's the sum, the totality of God's words, all the integration of the truth. And the sum of God's word and Jesus' words and the written word is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus says, I am in the Father. The Father and I are one. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am not of this world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and on and on and on. The great sum of the word is Jesus Christ himself. When we abide in the word, we abide in Christ, so we cannot claim to know Jesus if we don't abide in the word. 
Hopefully there's no more ambiguity there. Now I gotta mention real quickly about the phrase, truly my disciples, that he uses in John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Why would he say truly my disciples? And why would he say it to a group of people who had just confessed belief in him? I think obviously it means that, that, that there are people who are his disciples, but not truly. In other words, people who say they are his disciples, but they really aren't. Truly here just means really. Which means there are true disciples and untrue disciples. Okay? True Christians and untrue Christians. Disciple here just means Christian. Disciple here isn't an office of, that you attain. It just means Christian. So there's actual Christ, Christians and there are claimed to be Christians. There's a version of Christianity that is outward, that gives an appearance, and there is one that starts inward and takes root and changes everything about who you are. And honestly, throughout the scriptures, you get a clear indication, especially from Jesus, that there's really no in-between, right? It's terrifying to think about that, but it's unmistakable in the scriptures. It's all over the Bible, and I think it's all over the place now. A lot of people claim to be Christians, but truly aren't. This is what Jesus means in this passage that we're talking about. All these people believed, but didn't really. We saw just how that played out, which means there's three types of people here. People who say they're Christians and actually are true disciples. People who say they're Christians and actually aren't untrue disciples. And non-believers, people who don't claim to follow Christ at all. And a true disciple, according to what we just read, abides here. One example of an untrue disciple would be somebody whose faith is nominal or lukewarm. They dictate with their mouths that they're a Christian, but their actual Christian faith doesn't dictate much that they do. What country or city or neighborhood they live in, what schools their kids go to, all of these things not dictated by their relationship with Jesus what they do in their free time, what they do with their money, what they watch, what they listen to, who they hang out with, their conversations, not dictated by their time abiding in Christ. All dictated by something, all dictated by worldly reasons, but not their abiding. Their connection to the vine is claimed, but it's not actually true. The truth isn't cursing through them, Right, like the branch to the vine. The nutrients and water and life, the truth of the vine isn't cursing through them and overflowing out of them and therefore dictating the decisions that they make. Their lifestyle and their conversations aren't being pushed and pulled by the Holy Spirit, but by their flesh. So their social life or their hobbies or their passions or whatever gets them fired up, not spirit-led, flesh-led led by culture, led by worldview, political thought, whatever, but not by their time with Jesus. And I hope somebody just got convicted. I really do, because there is a lot of hope and opportunity in this message. Another example of an untrue disciple might be somebody who claims to know Jesus, but not exclusively the way he demands. They mix in other things, other beliefs, culture, worldview, whatever it may be, in order to create a version of Jesus that they just like better. Instead of committing or letting their commitment to truth define culture, they allow culture to define how all this gets interpreted. I would say that's another example of an untrue disciple. And both of these examples happen when we don't abide in the truth, right? So if you're saying, man, Brock, that's a little strong, don't you think, to share with a group full of believers? I don't know. Jesus was talking to those that believed. 
One verse earlier in verse 30, I don't think it was up on the slide, but in verse 30, right before he said that, it said, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So he had just had a huge response. He just did an altar call, man, and everybody came forward. He had a massive response. That's what took place before that entire exchange that we, show, that we shared. It's almost like he says this stuff because of the huge response. And he does this several times in the scriptures. In John 6, he does something very similar. After preaching on something really hard, the disciples say, this is hard teaching, who can accept it? To which Jesus says, have I offended you? It's one of my favorite lines of Jesus in scripture. <laughs> have I offended you? Then in verse 66, it says, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See, I think a large response sometimes can sweep people up into something that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise done if they were alone or if they knew fully what they were getting into. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like one person goes and then another one goes and then another one and all of a sudden you go and then everybody's in without really knowing what exactly they were getting into. And maybe they wouldn't have actually gone if no one else was going. I think that's kind of what creates emotion or experience-based movements. But Jesus doesn't assume here that all of this belief around him is legit. So he lays out a simple way to call out the phonies. And again, it's not the only time he's done this. But he says, all of you believers aren't really believers unless you're abiding in my word, unless you're accepting my words and my words live in you. So I encourage you, all of us, to take the same test because Jesus then, and I think now through his word, was not just revealing who was a true disciple and who wasn't, just for the purposes of declaring and judging it. He is coming back to do that, and he will do that. But until then, Jesus came, remember, to seek and save. And so as we hear these stories, and as he spoke then and as he speaks now, this is an opportunity for those that he was calling out that weren't truly believing, abiding, accepting all this word. It's an opportunity for us to draw near, right? To repent and draw near and connect. So receive that as an opportunity. Anyone that might be convicted by this, I'm telling you guys, this was my life. I was telling my wife on the way here, the reason this, I'm passionate about this is because that was me. When God rescued me, I would have said I was a believer, and I am fully convinced that I was not. I said I was, but I didn't. My life wasn't being dictated by my connection to the vine at all. I was just living life, saying I'm a Christian, not connected. It wasn't the truth of the vine of the trunk I wasn't a branch connected and just him cursing through me and living life as an extension of him at all but I said I was I said I was a Christian I grew up in church so this is my story and then there was a process of repenting and connecting and growing so there's opportunity in this now, I do want to say that abiding in him is a lot more than reading the Bible and memorizing it. That's not what I'm trying to say. Hopefully, the connection to abiding in Christ and abiding in the word of God has been very clear, but reading and memorizing is not what makes you a Christian. How do we know that? Well, one, the doing of anything can't make you a Christian. That would be a works-based gospel, and we know that we are saved by grace, through faith, right? Not by work so that no one can boast. We know that. So your abiding doesn't save you. It's just what saved people do. Number two, we know we can memorize scripture and not be a Christian because the Pharisees knew scripture. They knew it cold, but they were hypocrites, right? They washed, the outside of the cup was clean, the inside was greedy and wicked, but they knew scripture. 
Number three, the devil himself knew the scriptures and knows the scriptures. He used them to tempt Jesus. So we know that just reading and memorizing doesn't necessarily mean we're abiding in him. One can read and memorize the scriptures just to know more or debate better or have an intellectual faith that lacks true faith, true belief, or, or love. So that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is the reason for knowing the word of God and putting it to memory in our hearts and minds is to get to know Jesus. That's why. That's how we get to know him. This is how he speaks to us. And the point is to grow in love and in relationship with him. You cannot know Jesus without knowing his word. He reveals himself to us through his word. And I think that's the crisis of the church. Guys, bread of life, the bread of life, living water, right? The well that never runs dry. This is where we get it. This is where we get refreshed. This is where we get filled up so that we can live. Our abiding starts here. Um, without knowing the truth, you end up creating a truth. Influences and voices and culture and even other pastors or books or sermons create your truth for you. And so my encouragement is that you don't put all of your hope and trust and commitment on anyone else, what anyone else says about truth or anyone else says about God instead of what he says about himself. Be it a group of friends or uh, a popular Christian pastor or a Christian band or good books or YouTube sermons, um, many of them entertain us. So just be careful with that. A lot of this is, is entertainment based. Okay, you got a great looking guy wearing skinny jeans entertaining you all day long. And most of the time, there's just not a lot of meat. So be careful. And if Vic starts wearing skinny jeans and preaching messages that aren't here, you know, we'll deal with that. Just be careful. You know, it's like, that would be, I was thinking about that, and, and it would be like connecting to other branches. How silly would that be? The vine is there. The trunk is there, full of life and nu nutrients and water and everything that you need, and you, can, and, you, and you connect to other branches that you don't even know if they're connected. It makes no sense. We can all connect to the truth. It doesn't mean don't connect in your local church and listen to your pastor. It means measure. Measure what's being taught. Go to the Word. It's what Pastor Vic wants, believe me. All of you to go to his Word and study it and dig into it and know it. And then be encouraged when you're here. If you want to know Jesus, be much in his Word. Wake up early. Wake up early every day and spend time in his word. I call it my abiding time. My wife and my close friends and my missionary family, we take it very seriously. We ask each other all the time, how's your abiding going? What did you read today? What did God teach you through his word today? You know what I never hear? I didn't have time. Not from people who take this seriously. You just don't hear that. For the abider, this is sweet precious daily time. It's the most important thing in your day every day. It's not a Monday through Friday, take the weekends off. It's not employment. It's not work. It's time with Jesus. It's not take time off when you're traveling or busy or I just not having time. That doesn't make any sense. In any relationship that you have, would that make sense? If I said to you, babe, um, I've got a busy three days coming up. I'm not going to be spending any time with you, talking to you, or listening to you, because I got, I'm just busy. Would our relationship work like that? Absolutely not. Don't take time off 
from your abiding. And now some people I know might be saying, this sounds a little legalistic to me. This sounds like, uh uh-uh. That is not legalism. Legalism exists here. Legalism exists here. I'm not encouraging anyone to go to their time abiding with a legalistic motive, thinking that they might earn something or gain something. That is not my point. I'm encouraging us to abide here daily, to be refreshed here daily in order to get to know Jesus better, in order to equip yourself to fight your sin better. That's, and that's not legalism. Because when I abide well, the war against my sin, man, it's on. It is game on in my life when I'm abiding well. I'll tell you, when I detach a little bit or something does happen and I don't get that time, I slip. It's just how it works. I need it. This is, this is life. And by the way, the weekends or busy times or traveling or anything else, that's when I need it the most because I'm distracted. And so my commitment has to increase when I'm busy and distracted or running hard or, the, or, or life just has, I can't take time away here. I can't rob from here in order to do other things. Somebody recently told me that they heard a pastor tell them that they, when they go on vacation, they don't take their Bible because they take a break from everything, even that. Literal quote. I take a break from everything, even that. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. This guy shouldn't be a pastor. As you abide in the word and the truth takes root in your life and begins dwelling in you, it becomes the driving force for everything that you do. Abiding in the word gives you a filter. I want you to think of it that way just for a second. It gives you a filter for everything that you do and experience, and it replaces your old filters. That's the doctrine of being a new creation. Old is gone and new has come, only by abiding. Because remember, the water and the nutrients and the life of the vine is now consuming you. Right, It's taken you over, so the old filters of your upbringing or of society norms or of political thought or whatever it may be, all get replaced with one absolute truth. How sweet is that? All of these other filters, gone. One truth. Everything I hear, everybody I talk to, everything I experience in life, it's got to go through that filter. And it's going to sift out whatever's untrue. And I'm going to be left with truth. And aren't all those other filters subjective anyway? Right? Every other filter you can think of has biases and prejudices. One absolute truth. As you abide, as you rise early and spend time in the word and prayer and worship... The truth of the word takes root in your life. It begins a filter for you now of an unshakable truth that dictates everything in your life. It guides you, it protects you. Everything you see and experience has to come through it. So when your patience gets tested or circumstances are just overwhelming you, the truth of God's word rushes into that moment. Why? Because you've been abiding there you know it. God brings it to your memory. The Holy Spirit brings remembrance of the words of Jesus. When temptation comes, and man, whether it has to do with money or lies of financial security or sexual temptation, all these things that are always coming or pride or vanity, whatever it might be, That temptation now has to run through a filter, which, by the way, that filter is managed by the Holy Spirit. And so that temptation has to deal with spirit now. And I'm telling you what Satan wants that temptation to deal with is your flesh, my flesh. But when I'm abiding, it has to deal with the Holy Spirit. The other day, I was online doing Bible research. No kidding. 
I'm on a Bible research site and a pop-up for an ad of something came up with a half-naked woman. This happens all the time. And I'm just gonna confess, if I'm not abiding, there's a chance I fall for that. That's my own experience. When I'm abiding, it has no chance, none. And I think the reason is because if I'm abiding well, that temptation is having to deal with the Holy Spirit in my life. When I'm not abiding well, that temptation is dealing with my flesh. And my flesh is terrible. I need this. I'm sharing this message with you guys because I need it. And I know you need it. So if anyone's misunderstanding anything I'm saying to mean that, or to suggest that I've got it all figured out, it's the opposite. I'm sharing this with you because the only thing I've figured out about me is that I'm, I'm pretty terrible. My sin is nasty. And when I'm abiding in him, man, I can fight. I can fight my sin. And I can stand up to it with something that's a lot stronger than my flesh. When lies tell you that what you've done is unforgivable, that you've done it too many times, that he doesn't love you anymore, if you're abiding, his word, the truth, reminds you that his grace is an endless ocean. When subtle false gospels and, you know, it's all over, you can have it both. You can have it both ways. You can have Jesus and all the worldly things that you want, all the desires of your heart, girl. You go get them. I hear this stuff all the time. It's all about you. Life's all about you. You go. Man, the word of God comes rushing in and just stomps out those lies. But we've got to abide. I can't tell you how many times my morning time in the word has directly impacted something. I mean specific that, I've, that comes along that day. And that's so sweet. It's such a great reminder when he does that for us. He did it for me today. Yesterday I was telling my wife, you think I'm talking about the word too much? Like should I add in prayer and worship and these other things that are important when you talk about abiding? And I was kind of just struggling with it. Am I, am I going overboard? You know what my daily reading plan, my read through the Bible in a year daily reading plan was today? Psalm 119. That's where it landed. If you don't know Psalm 119, it's 178 verses about the word. It's all it says, 178 times. The word, the statutes, the commandments, the precepts, your word, your word, your word, your word. It's amazing. That happened for me today. And I was like, God, I hear you. So sweet. Without abiding in the word, I don't see how anyone can fight. Sin and just darkness and lies and all that is so rampant. It's everywhere. Without abiding, I do not know how anyone can fight. Remember, the prince of this world is trying to destroy us. Destroy us every day. Satan himself has been given some keys to roam about. And he hates us. He hates you. He hates your marriage. He hates your kids. And he's smart. He's smarter than me. Without this, I'm defenseless. I'm dead. I'm a dead branch unless I'm connected. Your hope, my hope, our only hope is King Jesus. That's it. And he said, you're going to be burned. You're going to burn if you don't abide. So I don't know how else to put it. My wife always talks about how people are fine with this logic in the world. Right? For worldly things. We see no problem with study, sacrifice, knowledge, preparation, all those things. In, in, a, in worldly things, what if your doctor was about to do surgery on you and he didn't really know much about medicine? He didn't really study it much. 
He's about to open you up and work on you, and he says, don't worry. What's important is that I'm, I'm, I, I'm a doctor. I call myself a doctor. It says right here, Brock Johnson, MD. Doesn't really matter that I don't know it. You wouldn't accept that. We wouldn't accept that. We wouldn't accept that from a lawyer or an accountant or a mechanic, right? So why is it that that makes perfect sense? Yet when Jesus says, if you don't abide in my word, you're going to be burned up. Life is going to choke you out. And in the end, you're going to be called a phony. You're going to be gathered up and tossed into the fire. And we just go, eh. Okay. Guys, that should drive us to the truth. That should motivate us to abide. Levi, you guys can come back up. I do want to say something just real quick. To be saved, you don't have to understand or know the Bible. So don't misunderstand, depending on where you are in your journey, anything that I've said today. To be saved, you don't have to know all of this doctrine. All you have to know is that you are a sinner. And God gave his son Jesus as a savior. And to be saved, you have to abandon all of your dependence on yourself your reliance on yourself, and run to Jesus. To be saved, that's all you need to know. Put your faith and trust in him and what he's done. Then, abide. Then, connect, abide, stay, remain. It satisfies you. It replaces the old. It leads you, it directs you, guides you. For me, to abide in Christ and his word means to first and foremost spend significant time in his word. I encourage you to do it even if you don't desire it at first. Do it because Jesus says to do it. Okay, do it because it's what you've heard today from him. Let God cultivate the desire. He will. You spend extravagant time here, he will. Taste and see. If you don't currently do anything, start with 15 minutes. Get a Bible reading plan. Ask your pastor or some elders or email me. I can recommend something for you. If you do 15 minutes or so a day or a short devotion, I wanna encourage you to go for 45 minutes. Increase it. This, this is a mind field of treasure. Increase it. Spend more time. Dig a little bit deeper. Get into some commentaries and find something that can help kind of stir you along in that. If you do 45 minutes, go for an hour and a half. You cannot spend enough time. You cannot find all the treasures here that God has for you to find. Yes, there's work to be done. Yes, there's ministry to do, but it's fueled by this it's fueled by your abiding. It's what motivates us. So start here and then remain there. So when your Bible gets left on your desk or in your car and you go out and you're living your life, remain there. Let the truth and the beauty of the word of God that's in you be manifested in every facet of your life. As you remain in him, he remains in you, like the branch to the vine. And that fruit at the end that gets produced, you didn't produce it. He did. Which is way better. Trust me. Because we can make fake fruit. You want to be the branch that allows him to pass through and produce the fruit that he wants to fr produce. We get to be a pass-through. all the branches just a pass through he'll produce fruit in your life like the fruits of the spirit but even more glorious than that your abiding in the vine allows your life to be a pass through that God uses to bring glory to himself let's pray Lord Jesus 
thank you for your word. God, thank you that you reveal yourself. You speak to us. You lead us. You guide us. You protect us. Lord, as we abide in you. God, I pray um, that we would be better abiders. Lord, lead us, convict us to abide in you so that you can abide in us. God, and we can bring glory to your name in this life. God, I pray that this would be a message that would stay in hearts and minds for all of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Rock. Yeah. Sorry, man. It's all good. So instead of having Levi come up, we're going to uh, cut to the next part. Let's give it up for Brock. Thank you for that word, brother. It's always from, from his heart and from the Lord. Amen. So if I could call up the elders, as uh, Vic spoke about earlier today, um, this morning, Last week was the last week that he was going to preach for a while, and today is the last Sunday he's going to be here at Emmaus officially. So as the elders assemble here, we're going to ask Vic to come up too, and we're going to pray him out. Um, while they're coming up to the stage, if you are not getting the weekly newsletter, the email newsletter, please send an email to info at EmmausJax.com. That's info at EmmausJax.com. You'll be added to that because that is the only way you're going to get our contact information. It's not on the website. Um, it's not published anywhere. So if you want to reach out to somebody here at Emmaus during Vic's absence, sign up for that email, and we'll get that information to you. So with that said, anybody want to kick us off? Father, we, uh, we, we thank you for this man. We thank you for uh, the way that you work his life and through him and work with this body, Lord, we, we want to pray uh, just specifically for, for this time as a sabbatical, as a, as a rest in you, Lord, that uh, you would work in his heart and his life, that you would uh, speak to him clearly, and that this could be a time of uh, not only refreshing, but just growing in faith and confidence vision from you, Lord. Um, so we pray your blessings over over him, your favor over him and over his family and over this body in the in the coming weeks. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the uh, the blessings of, that you provide through this body of believers that we are able to send Vic off uh, for a time of rest and refreshment pray for him. We pray for his wife, Roxanne, and his children that they find uh, rest and refreshment at the same time, and they grow stronger together as a family, uh, and that you fill this family with the joy and the love uh, that you and you alone can provide. We also ask that uh, during uh, this time that we all, all of us, um, find time to abide in your word, find time to live out the mission that you call for each and every one of us, and as together as a family and as a body of believers, that we all grow and become better um, followers of your word uh, during this time. And God, we love Vic and his family, and thank you for leading them to us here. There's a long list of things he does in our midst. Um, I just appreciate uh, the solid word he brings us in his messages. I appreciate how he just cares, goes deeply for each one of the Mayas. And I thank you for his friendship. And Father, I'm excited to see and hear God just what you're going to do and how you're going to lead Vic in this time. So, Father, as we send Vic, um, just pray that it would be a time that he could separate himself from the world and uh, separate himself from all of the things that pull on him. Uh, this would be a time that he could uh, dig deep into your presence, um, be with his family. Um, and we just pray, Lord, that um, 
you would bring encouragement for the ministry here at Emmaus, that we're, we're following you well and doing what it is you've called us to do. And that if there's any adjustment and provision or whatever it is, Lord, that you're calling us to, that you would make that clear as well during this time. So we just pray, Lord, for your peace. And we pray for refreshment. And um, we just thank you that it's an opportunity for all of us to step up and be the church to each other in Vic's absence. So we, uh, we love you, Lord. We love Vic. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. All right. Um, yeah, this is my last time here for a while. So if you guys will stand, I'll do a word of benediction for us as we go. All right, brothers and sisters on the journey, may you abide in him. May you abide in the vine. May his word abide, abide in you and you in his word. May the spirit fill you. May you go in the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, shining the light of Jesus wherever you go. Grace and peace to you. I'll see you soon. Appreciate y'all.